Hey everyone, how's it going? Well, after the nightmare that was Spider-Man issue 21 through 26, or dead language as the trade holding the issues are called, let's talk about something less horrific for this. Let's say more official beginning of mythology month, shall we? Once again, we'll dive into the Greek pantheon, but no, it won't be Lore Olympus or Wonder Woman again. Instead, we will be diving into the world where the gods train their children to be the next generation of heroes. At not a school, but a summer camp of all things. Welcome to Camp Half-Blood and the world of Percy Jackson and the Olympians. Starting out as a five-part series of books by author Rick Ryden that tells the tale of 12-year-old Percy Jackson as he enters the world that reveals that the Greek myths and legends are proven to be very real and the responsibilities he now carries. The books were a major success, leading to, of course, adaptations, with a not-so-great film adaptation 2010, a Disney Plus series coming in 2024, a musical surprisingly in 2014, and of course a comic adaptation that was released around the same time as the film, under the Disney Hyperion imprint. Of course, done to help milk the series as much as possible, as they assumed that the films were going to be a big hit, much like Harry Potter or the Lord of the Rings franchise, but feels more like a reminder of what the films failed to do. Now, I won't be bashing the film adaptation for the whole video, but do expect me to call out some of the major changes that the film made and why it didn't work. Most of the time, however, we'll be sticking with the comic adaptation, which did try to be a more faithful adaptation, though also made a few changes. What did they change? Well, let's get into Disney Hyperion's comic adaptation, Percy Jackson and the Olympians, The Lightning Thief, and see how it holds up. Warning spoilers. Our story begins with a private middle school field trip to New York City's Metropolitan Museum of Art, where we are introduced to our hero, learning about the story of Kronos from his teacher, Mr. Bunner. He asks Percy about the story as he feels like he's not paying attention, and Percy is able to tell a story pretty well, but when he then asks him the importance of the story, he struggles, and Mr. Bunner tells Percy he's going to have to talk to him after the field trip, leading him to be teased by the other students. He's then told by another teacher, Mrs. Dodds, that she has to talk to him in private, where she demands that Percy confesses committing some sort of crime. He tries to tell her that he has no clue what she's talking about, resulting to Mrs. Dodds revealing herself as a fury. To those that don't know, furies act as the gods of vengeance, and usually are sent by gods whenever they need to inflict divine punishment on mortals. Luckily, Mr. Bunner shows up, the wrong Percy a pen, which immediately turns into a sword, slicing her in half. Her remains turn into dust, which should be a big deal, but Percy looks disinterested. Dude, you just vaporized your pre-algebra teacher. How are you not freaked out about this? He does ask what happened to her, but Mr. Bunner pretends nothing happened. Why do I have the feeling that Mr. Bunner is the type of guy to dump his yard trimmings in a lake? Later that night, he walks out to get some air and ends up overhearing a conversation with his best friend Grover with Mr. Bunner about how he doesn't believe Percy should be alone during the summer. After what happened with the Fury. The following day, Percy's heading home only for Grover to come along and try to talk him into tagging along with him during the summer break. But Percy ditches him. Not because of what he heard the other night, but because of his home life. Percy returns home to see that he lives in a dump. Though he has a loving mother who actually planned out a fun beach day with him, his stepfather is, well, human garbage. Who treats both of them so horribly, Percy just doesn't understand why his mother would live with someone like this. But hey, at least they get to go to the beach, right? Nope, a hurricane breaks out, and though Percy and his mom are safe in a cabin, they have no power and have to make a fire for warmth. His mother, however, does try to find a silver lining, saying it reminds her of the day she met his father. The tender moment, though, is cut short as Grover comes in, soaked, tired, and now has goat legs, telling them that they need to run now. They drive off, but they are struck by lightning and then attacked by the Minotaur, who takes Percy's mom and suddenly kills her. In anger, Percy attacks the monster, tearing its horn off and stabs it. Percy passes out from exhaustion. When he wakes, he finds himself at Camp Half-Blood, a haven for children of the Greek gods, with Mr. Bunner, who reveals himself to actually be Chiron, the legendary trainer of heroes, as one of the instructors, and Dionysus, the former god of wine, now god of cola, as Zeus has forced him into a life of sobriety as punishment. Yeah, long story short, Dionysus hooked up with a nymph that was off-limits, because apparently Zeus called dibs. Yeah, Zeus is definitely on point in this series, as the head of the camp. Chiron then introduces Percy to Annabeth, daughter of Athena, and in the book was the one who actually helped treat Percy after his fight, which the film just omitted completely to have this rivals turn lover story. The comic does mention it with Percy having an awkward conversation, but 
for some reason omitted the actual scene. I can't find a reason why, as it was a pretty solid introduction to her character, but oh well, and Luke, son of Hermes, one of the camp counselors, and Percy's bunkmate until they figure out who his father is. Yeah, to those only familiar with the movie, the identity of Percy's father was actually played off as a bit of a mystery for the first half of the book. Sure, it's pretty obvious when you're an adult, especially when there was a moment where Percy causes the toilet to explode with the water when defending himself from the camp bully, Clarice, daughter of Ares. But since this series was made for a younger audience and to help set a younger audience have a better understanding of Greek mythology, it's understandable for them not to catch on at first. This also led to a very interesting montage of Luke and Percy spending the next three days trying to figure out who his godly parent is. And I say parent because they do consider that it could be Aphrodite who just shapeshifted into a man, which is possible. There is a story of gods doing that a lot in Greek myth. It's not until Percy participates in an intense game of Capture the Flag where he learns the truth, that his father is Poseidon, god of the sea. Now what comes next is actually very important, as it was one of the driving forces to the series, but the movie just ignored it. That being the fact that Percy wasn't supposed to be born. Apparently, during World War II, the children of Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades played a major role and caused insane devastation. They never specify who these children were, but given Oppenheimer's history, point is the damage was so great the three brothers swore to never have children again. But asking Zeus to wrap it up is like telling Dave Zaflab to use his head. Do we have another kid, a daughter named Thalia, and once Hades found out about the betrayal, he sent monsters to have her killed. Zeus, taking pity on her, turns her into a tree, which actually is used to protect the camp. Chiron goes on to finally tell Percy what's going on. Percy's mom married that asshole just to protect him, since apparently his human stink masked his blood from enemies. And Zeus's Master Bolt, the weapon he used to defeat Kronos, was stolen, and Percy is the prime suspect. As it seems, Zeus discovered Percy and Poseidon were connected before anyone else. Along with that, Poseidon has a history of trying to usurp Zeus, which is true, so it looks pretty bad. However, Chiron believes that they are innocent and tasks Percy into going on a quest to prove it. His reasoning being that if Percy can find the bolt and retrieve it, Zeus won't see them as suspects and as a way to also make peace between the two brothers. To help get an idea of where to start first, Chiron suggests to talk to the spirit of Delphi, an undead ghost of the Oracle of Delphi who lives within a corpse. She speaks in riddles and double meanings, but she makes it very clear that Percy must go west, where he will meet a treacherous god and be betrayed by someone he calls friend. Chiron theorizes the traitor must be Hades, as he has plenty of reasons to see his brothers defeated. And since all souls go to the underworld, that also means Percy's mother is there, so besides clearing his name, Percy will be going on a rescue mission to save his mother. Percy and Grover gear up, along with Annabeth, who volunteers to help them on their mission. They head off where, like in the book and the film, run into obstacles that harken back to Greek myth, though it's limbed down to only being two. Between those obstacles, they gain the assistance from Ares, who is all too eager to help them go to the underworld, even handing them a bag full of cash and supplies. Once they get there, they encounter Hades. They can learn that Hades isn't the thief and that, in fact, he was robbed along with Zeus's bolt. Someone stole his magic helmet. Kudos to Raiden for remembering the helmet, as I notice how a lot of stories based on Greek mythology tend to ignore it. It doesn't help that Percy discovers that he's actually had the bolt the whole time. It's been in the bag, which means he was set up. Percy and the gang escape, and given they got the bag from Ares, it's no surprise that the traitor god was actually him. He claims to be the mastermind as a way to cause an epic war worthy of his title, but Percy calls him out and claims that someone else is pulling the strings. They fight, and while usually Percy wouldn't stand a chance against Ares, he gains a power-up due to him standing in the ocean, and actually is able to defeat him. A shadowy mass surrounds Ares, however, and he escapes, but drops the helmet. A fury witnesses this, and Percy is cleared of his charges, gets the bolt back to Zeus, and Percy and his father have a heart-to-heart, -heart. and of course, Percy gets his mother back from the underworld. However, Percy is sad to learn that the actual lightning thief was Luke, who has actually sent Percy up as a way to free Kronos, but before he can be brought to justice, left the camp without a trace. Which is very different from the book, as Percy actually confronts Luke, where he tells him how he planned to free Kronos and tear Olympus down out of frustration on how the gods were treating him, and Luke nearly kills Percy and gets away. But Percy survives to fight Luke another day. As for how that goes, eh, story for another time. But this comic is pretty fun, however, it does have its flaws. Though Raiden did write the original novel, the comic was actually adapted by Robert Vendetti, who to be clear is a very talented writer. I definitely recommend his Superman 76 comic, but it feels like he stripped down too much of the story. Yes, when adapting, you expect something to be left out, but I felt that some more grandiose moments were kind of toned down due to a lack of inner monologue. 
like when Percy sees Hades for the first time, or cutting out some of the pretty awesome scenes like most of the monsters and obstacles that they encountered on the mission. In the book, Percy and the gang encountered more furies, Medusa, the killer Procrustus, a battle with the Chimera and Echidna, aka the mother of all monsters, and the encounter with the Lotus Eaters, but decided to cut the adventure in half and do the last two. My guess it was due to the scenes maybe being seen as too dark, so Disney told him to cut it, but still, what was kept was handled pretty well, and the characters were still on point on how Raiden wrote them. With that, we move on to characters, starting with the water boy himself, Percy Jackson. Percy is the classic kind hero archetype. He means well, loves his mother, and though scared of the threats he faces, is willing to face them if it means lives being saved. He's kind of like Billy Batson in a way. He's not perfect though. The kid is slow in the uptake, has obviously unresolved issues with his father, gets into fights without thinking, leading him to only survive by either dumb luck or his friends helping him. Still, there's a reason he's up there with other young heroes like Harry Potter, the Pevensies, and Timothy Hunter. Hell? Oh, don't get me started. Point is, Percy is awesome. Next, we have Groper, Percy's best friend and Seda protector. Though timid in nature, and is the one that will usually try to pull Percy back if he thinks things are getting too dangerous, he's still willing to step up when things get dire. He's willing to put himself on the line to help Percy save the day. Though, it's not just for Percy, as he hopes to fulfill his own mission. He believes that if he succeeds with Percy, he'll have the chance to go on the quest to find the nature god Pan, who's gone missing, and see if he can help undo the damage humanity has caused to the environment. Vinay did a good job adapting the character, and I was happy to see most of his best moments didn't get cut. Next, we finish off the trio with Annabeth, daughter of Athena and the strategist of the team. A lot of people like to compare her to Hermione from the Potter series, as she does inform Percy on some of the monsters and spells they encounter on the mission, which I can see, but she's more willing to make questionable moves, like when she uses Percy as bait during the Capture the Flag game. It makes it where both Percy and the readers are left unsure if she can be truly trusted, which does lead to the possibility that she could be the traitor that Percy was warned about, leading the reader on edge. By the end, though, she proves that she is truly on Percy's side, but even then, will keep you guessing on how she might approach a situation. As the last character I'm going to talk about individually, we got the true lightning thief, Luke, who before is revealed start off as a very likable guy. He's almost played off as a big brother figure to Percy, and the heart-to-heart -heart they have regarding their fathers is a nice moment when you first read it. But once you learn the truth, all of those scenes start to mean something different, as we see the nice guy revealed to be filled with anger and frustration towards the world. Though you don't see him being villainous in the comic, you get a sense of horror in knowing what he was trying to do to Percy and the evil he planned to unleash. Nice way to build up your villain. And for the other characters like Charon, Dionysus, Ares, Hades, or any of the other campers, they're fine, but there's not much to say about them individually. We get a good idea of their personalities, especially with Chiron having the most to do as Percy's mentor and trainer, but no real arc to follow, nor a moment that is super memorable that didn't involve Percy. And as for Ares, he's mostly just a dragon, but unlike Rabin in the last review, he actually has interesting things to say, and helps set up stuff regarding Clarice in later stories. All around, solid cast. The art was done by Attila Futaki, who some might know for his work on the Severed series. His work here, eh, it's okay, but the character's expressions are off. I guess trying to emulate a classic style similar to what we would associate with Greek art, but unfortunately the characters suffer by having dull reactions. And when he does show reaction, it's kind of doofy. Again, it's not the worst, and he's done some great work, but this was not one of them, at least to me. So yeah, I recommend the comic adaptation of Percy Jackson and the Olympians Lightning Thief. It has flaws, but it's definitely a better option to recommend to fans than the movies, at least until the show comes out. Do I recommend this over the books? No, but it's the next best thing. Thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell to keep updated. Next time, we've had fun journeying through the West, but how about the East? Tune in next time to find out. Later.